This is similar to the photograph of a person. Suppose I have a photograph of Brother John. If I show you the photograph and ask you who it is, you'll be correct if you say that it is Brother John. However, we must be careful. For although it is a picture of Brother John, it is not the real person of Brother John. It is simply a photograph of Brother John, depicting his appearance and giving you some idea of what he is like. Likewise, in Genesis 2, we see a figure or picture of Christ and the church in the types of Adam and Eve. When we examine the picture of Adam and Eve, we understand how the church comes into existence. It will be difficult to understand this if we simply talk about Christ and the church. However, if we look at the picture, we will be very clear. The picture saves a great many words. If I describe Brother John to you using many words, it will be still difficult for you to picture what he is like. However, if I show you this photograph, you will be immediately be clear about him. Although the photograph is not the real person, it does afford you some understanding of the person, relieving you of the need to guess. God uses the picture of Adam and Eve in Genesis 2 to give, give us a definite revelation of Christ and the church. Without this chapter, we could never understand the relationship between Christ and the church so exactly. This picture shows how the church came into being. Please remember that Genesis 1 and 2 unveil two main things. Genesis 1 reveals God's eternal purpose, which is to express himself through man and to exercise his dominion with man. Man was created to express God and to represent God. Genesis 2 continues by showing the way to fulfill God's purpose. Although God has a purpose, he must have a means for fulfilling it. What is God's divine way of accomplishing His purpose? As we have seen, His way is life. God desires to come into us as life. In order to accomplish His purpose, God wants to come into man to be man's life and life supply. Furthermore, Genesis 2 reveals that God's procedure involves three steps. The first step was for God to create man as a vessel to contain him as life. Since man was made as a vessel to contain God, man can live by him, express him, and represent him. As the second step, God placed man in front of the tree of life. We have seen that the tree of life represents God himself. In placing man before the tree of life, God was indicating that he wanted man to take him into his being, that he might be transformed into the precious materials for the building up of the church. The third step, to work God into man as life. Now we come to the third step. The first step was to make the vessel. The second was to put this vessel in front of the tree of life. And the third is to work God into man as life. How can God work himself into man as life? Praise the Lord that we have an allegory to help us understand. We need to have a clear view of this allegory. Although you are familiar with the story of Adam's marriage, perhaps you have never been impressed with its significance. The background. Chapter 2, verse 18 to 20. God created the heavens, which are for the earth, and the earth, which is for man. Then God created man, who is for God, with a spirit to receive him. Man typifies God as the real universal husband, who is seeking a wife for himself. Not good for God to be alone. After man was created, God said of him, It's not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his complement. Although man was perfect, he was not complete. For example, a human head is perfect, but without the body, it is incomplete. Every person resembles a half of a watermelon. Since he is just a half of watermelon, he is incomplete. Although he is perfect, he needs a counterpart to complete him. It takes the two halves of a watermelon to make a whole melon. Likewise, a man and a wife resembling the two halves of a watermelon.
together make a complete unit. This is why I frequently tell the young people to get married. If you are unmarried, though you may be a perfect person, you are incomplete. Thus, as God looked at Adam, He seemed to say, "Adam, you are perfect, but you are only a half a unit. You are too lonely. I will make a complement for you. I will make you a counterpart." Man is a type of God, the real universal husband. Before God had secured the proper man, he was alone. It was not good for man to be alone. Although God is absolutely and eternally perfect, He is not complete. To say that God is imperfect is to speak blasphemy. Our God is eternally perfect. Nevertheless, without the church, He is incomplete. Without the church, He is like a husband without a wife, or like a head without a body. Therefore, when God said that it was not good for Adam to be alone, it meant that God Himself was incomplete, and that it was not good for him to be alone. Adam's need for a wife typifies and portrays God's need to have a complement. If we see this, every aspect of Genesis two will be clear. No one like God to be His complement. Out of the ground, God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, and brought them to Adam. When God brought a horse to Adam, perhaps Adam said, "This is a horse. This animal can never match me because it has four feet and I have two." When God brought a cow before Adam, perhaps Adam said, "This is a cow. It has two horns. It does not resemble me, and it cannot be a complement to me." God brought item after item to Adam, and Adam gave names to all the cattle, to all the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But he did not find among them a complement for himself, one that could match him. Although Adam, having wisdom, named all the creatures, he seemed to say, "All of them are far removed from me. They don't look like me. How can I have any of them as my counterpart?" After fulfilling the task of naming all the creatures, Adam, in a sense, was disappointed. Among the entire creation, he could not find one to match him. To compliment him, however, God knew exactly what He was doing.